before we open God's word this morning, let's have a word of prayer. Once again, to invite God to be with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here this Sabbath day. We thank you for the love of God warming and filling our hearts even as the temperatures outside are a little bit more chilly and a little bit cold. We still see your love all around us, and we are so thankful for that. We're thankful for a warm church that we can worship in. Amen. Lord, we're thankful for the word of God that you've given us that gives us encouragement and hopes, points us to Jesus Christ, that word that became flesh and dwelt among us, and still through the power of the Holy Spirit dwells with us today. We are thankful for that. We pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds that we'll understand the words that we read that will bring comfort and hope to us and lighten our path uh, for the coming week. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. The story goes, whether it's true or not, I'm not totally sure, but the story goes about the famed philosopher Bertrand Russell giving a lecture in a hall, and he had finished giving his lecture, and he'd been talking about the intricacies of the universe and his idea of how the universe came to be, when he had this dear old lady come up to him and start talking to him and said, this is all fine and well, but don't you know that the earth is actually flat and it sits on the back of a giant tortoise? He's like, well, that's interesting. So he decides he's going to play along and he says, okay, well, that's interesting. So what is this? giant tortoise sitting on. She says, well, there's even a giant, bigger tortoise than this tortoise is sitting on. And he says, okay, well, that, that second tortoise, what is he on? And at that point, she wises up and she says, now don't you get so smart on me, Sonny. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> I was talking to one of my Bible students when I was overseas we're talking about creation and talking about how this world came to be and talking about how God created the heavens and the earth. And he asked this question, and maybe you've heard this question before as well. All right, well, if God created the world, who created God? But I could ask the same question in reverse. All right, so the world tells us today. Modern science tells us that this world that you and I descended from apes, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, where did those apes descend from? Okay, well, they, they have an answer for that. They say those apes uh, descended uh, from some sort of uh, mammal that was at one time a fish that came to land, right? Mm -hmm. Have you heard this before? That fish uh, developed legs and arms and uh, gradually, slowly, and, and came onto land. Okay, well, that's fine. Where did the fish come from? Well, back a while before that, there was a single-celled organism, and that developed into a fish. I'm giving the very condensed version of all of this. And before that, before that fish, before that single-celled organism, where did that single-celled organism come from? Well, there was something that that single cell organism, there was some proteins that were in some primordial ooze, and those all came together, and it, famed, it, it formed that single cell organism. And so you ask, where did those proteins come from? Going, you see my point, right? Where you, you come to a logical conclusion, the logical conclusion reaches three possible alternatives. Three possible solutions, I should say. Three possible solutions. The one, there being a God, an all-knowing God who created the heavens and the earth, and that God had no other creator. He was. This was a, an intelligent being that has, has lived from age to age, and he was before even time itself began, in a sense. Before the creation as we know it has happened. That's one possible answer. That's the, 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 the version the Bible gives. The second one is that something came from nothing. There was just nothing, and then all of a sudden, there was a spark of whatever, and that came to be. The other option, and it seems to be, in my 
limited understanding that the evolutionists would say at one time there was something, there was an all-knowing atom or something that split and became what we have now, today. There was some sort of material, a not a smart material, not the, something that could create anything in of itself, but through billions of years it came to what we have today, but there was something that always existed, and yet they say it wasn't God. It was the all-knowing Adam, if you will. The Bible has a different answer. If you go to Genesis chapter 1, and if you're following along, and you're familiar with this story, uh, many times you've heard it, probably when you were in Sabbath school or yourself. If you're on Facebook, maybe you heard it in Sunday school. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why is this important? Why would God start in this way? It's interesting that the, this is laid out. G God says, in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. John, in his gospel, takes it a step further, and he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He doesn't even start at creation. He starts before creation with God. He says, in the beginning was God. This seems to be an important point, an important point that we came from God. And so the story goes on. And it's a beautiful story of how God created this world. The first... He says, I want, it's dark right now. In this chaos that of, of this earth, of earth that is without form and void, he says, it's dark. So darkness was over the face of the earth. He spoke light. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And then he said, the, this is just covered with mud and ooze. I'm going to separate the skies. I'm going to separate the waters so there will be a sky and there will be an earth. And there was dry land. And the second day, he says, in the evening, in the morning, was the second day. And he continues this, and every time he says, it was good. God looked upon it, and he said, it was good. And then he comes to that sixth day. He's already created the fish, and he's created the the um, see the birds in the skies and the, and the animals in the and below. And on the sixth day, he creates the land animals and populates the earth. But he says that's not enough. And so he comes to Genesis chapter one and verse twenty-six. He says, "Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness." Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be, food, be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God, notice what God says. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed... It was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God has finished his crowning act of creation. He has created man. He has formed him out of the dust of the ground, breathed his life into his nostrils. And then, instead of saying in the evening and the morning were the sixth day, and, and what God looks over everything and he calls it good, instead he calls it very good. In fact, it was so good, the next day, God took an entire day to look over what he had created. In Genesis chapter 2, we read, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished, 
And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. God does not rest because he is tired, but it is like an artist who sits back and says, looks over his work and says it is finally accomplished. The beauty, the what I wanted to create has been done, and God looks at that and he says, wow. Especially when it comes to the people that he's created. Creation teaches us about the sanctity of our own human life. It teaches us that we are more than just a mistake. It teaches us about the love of a creator God. It teaches us about the power of a created God. But we come to that question, how can I truly believe this? And we try, as Christians, we try oftentimes to prove Christianity, to prove Christianity, to prove creation. There's a lot of evidence for creation, but there's also evidence for evolution. And so what do you do? It's interesting that the Bible doesn't try to prove creation. This is my second point. The Bible does not try to prove that there is a creator God. Instead, the Bible states, in the beginning, God. It doesn't ask for you to prove it. It doesn't ask for you to reason it through. It doesn't ask you to ask the question, well, who created God then? Instead, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The psalmist says that the heavens declare the glory of God. We see evidence around us, but ultimately it comes down to a decision that you're going to make. Am I going to put my faith in a primordial ooze, or am I going to put my faith in a God that I read about in this scripture who says that he loves me and he cares for me, and he is the one who created me? Amen. I'd like to ask, I know I don't usually put you on Facebook, if I have a volunteer who doesn't mind being live streamed right now, who would mind just coming up, you don't have to say anything, I just want you to come and stand, sit in this chair. Do I have a volunteer? Anyone? I'm coming. All right, Joe's coming. Great. Thank you, Joe. Can you have a seat in this chair? I sure would. All right. I never had one with a cushion on it. <laughs> well, I won't keep you here very long. I want to ask you, Joe, why did you sit in this chair? Because you asked me. I asked you to. Okay, how did you know that I wasn't going to like pull the chair out from under you? I was going to watch you. <laughs> you were going to watch me, okay. <laughs> how did you know this chair was going to hold you up? It looks like a good solid chair. It looks like a good solid chair, okay. I could have pulled Frank on you. I could have pulled it out. I could have been sinister and just been like, I'm going to find a chair that is just the flimsiest chair I can see, and you're going to sit in it, and I'm going to laugh. Right? But you trusted that your pastor probably wouldn't do that to you. Yeah. That the chair would probably hold you up. Right? Absolutely. I've even trusted truck drivers that weren't trustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go down the road, right? You're going down the road and you trust that the person that is on coming on the other lane isn't some maniac that's going to cross over onto your side. Right? You can have a seat. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. We put faith in something every day. We make faith based on the evidence we've seen oftentimes, but ultimately we make choices and decisions of who we're going to trust and who we're not going to trust, not knowing for sure whether that's going to stand up. But that faith is a starting point. The faith is a starting point for something that can become great. And God, when he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, he is asking you to take a leap of faith. He's saying, I know you don't fully understand it. I know that you don't fully see the end from the beginning. I know that you have questions about who God is and what he says. But I want you to take this understanding that I am a God of creative power, and I want to do that for you as well. Because you see, creation means so much more than God created the earth a while back. He set things in motion, and he just let them go from there. That's what the deists believed back in the 1700s. They believed that God set the world in motion, there was a creator God, but he set science in place and let things happen from here on out. And indeed, God is the one who created science itself and the laws 
of science that we follow, uh, that are followed today as well. But creation means much, so much more than this, because if you turn with me to Psalms 51 and verse 10, Psalm 51 and verse 10. Psalm 51 and verse 10, uh, David's famous prayer after he has committed sin uh, with sleeping with Bathsheba, someone else's wife, and then killing the husband. After that sin is pointed out to him, David realizes the uncleanness of his heart, and he prays this beautiful prayer. We're not going to go over the whole prayer right now, but he uses this word in verse 10. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. The word for create here is the same word that is used in Genesis when God created the heavens and the earth. There is another word that can be used for creation. That is the word that we use when we make something or do something ourselves. We take material and we put it together and do something for ourselves. But this word of creation that is found in Psalms and that is found in Genesis is the word that is only used for God being able to create something. You see, the same God that created the heavens and the earth, that spoke and stars came into existence, that spoke and flowers sprung forth from the earth, is the same God that speaks hope into our lives. Mm -hmm. It is the same God who, when we say, Lord, my desires are evil, my inclinations are evil, but I want a clean heart, please give that to me, Please create in me a clean heart. God can speak something from nothing. And he can take that stony heart and create a heart of flesh that will love the creator God and will love his creation as well. If you turn with me to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. This is an important uh, text for us as we think about our Christian journey. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Paul says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The same God who created this earth that went through that process of seven days. He could have, he could have chosen to do it in one day. Mm -hmm. He could have chosen to do it in a thousand days. But we are told he chose to do it in seven days. And as he works through that process of creation, he is working through a process of recreation with each and every one of us. If he begun that good work, he is going to complete that good work in us as well. So creation was so important that creation becomes the foundation of worship itself. We read about this in our scripture reading this morning in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 is probably the most crucial, if not the most, one of the most crucial, if not the most crucial part of Revelation. It's found in the center of the book where the uh, Hebrew mind would put their most important thoughts. And we find the foundation for worship right within the first angel's message here in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell in the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Why are we called to worship God? It's because he's our creator. We worship God because he's redeemer. This is what we focus on as Christian in Christianity. We realize that Jesus saved us from our sins. But the reason that the Bible gives for worshiping God is that he's our creator. He's the only one that deserves worship. Even if I saved you, Shane, if, I, if you were drowning in a pool of water and I was somehow was able to pull you out and rescue you, you wouldn't worship me because I'm not your creator, right? Worship 
is a, re is a recognition of who God is. The word actually literally comes from the idea of bowing down to a, an important dignitary or a king, prostrating yourself, bowing down before them. And the only one who truly deserves that is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Amen. It's such an important thing that God instituted a day out of every week that we would remember this. In Genesis chapter 2, we, taught, we, we, we already read about how God sanctified, set apart the Sabbath. He took the day, a day for him to rest and reflect, even though he does not get tired or weary. He took that time to rest and reflect. And he gave us that opportunity as well. In Exodus chapter 20, if you'll turn with me right there right now, Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, 20, right in the heart of the Ten Commandments of God, he says this. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God created this day for us to reflect upon our Creator. For us to remember as a memorial of that creation that He did for each and every one of us. There are memorials that are given for salvation as well. We celebrate uh, communion as a, as a reminder that God saved us from our sins. We celebrate baptism as a reminder that God saved us from sin. But there is only one institution that allows us to remember that God is our creator, and that is, a, that is the Sabbath. In Deuteronomy, the Sabbath also took on the emphasis, if you want to look it up later, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 and 14, the Sabbath took on another emphasis of salvation as well. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because I led you out of slavery in Egypt. God has led us out of the slavery of sin, and the Sabbath becomes a reminder of that, the rest, to, taking apart, not in the works of this world, but instead reflecting and resting upon God, becomes a symbol and a reminder of the rest that we put in Jesus, trusting in Him for our salvation and not for ourselves as well. But for, for me, for all, too long, for all too long, the Sabbath just became something that I had to prove to someone else. I knew all the texts to talk about how the Sabbath is on the seventh day, not on the sixth day, or the first day, either of those days, any of those days. How God wants us to worship Him on every day, but He has given us the Sabbath as a special day to remember Him as the Creator. But the Sabbath became just something that was kind of a mark that showed that I was different from everyone else. However, that was never the purpose of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is meant for rest and is meant to remember that we have a creator who also recreates us each and every day. I disagree. The Sabbath is a mark. It is a mark. That is, that is true. It is a mark, but it's not just a mark. It's not just something that separates me from others. It's not a thus saith God, I have to, so I have to do it, although he does, right? He says, thus saith it, so I do it. But why do I keep the Sabbath? It's because of my relationship with God. It's because of something that he, want, he has given to me. It's not a burden that he has given to me saying, I want you to do this so you're different from everyone else, even though I may end up looking different than everyone else. But he's given me the Sabbath as a gift, as a gift and a reminder <coughs> of the, where, my place in life that I am the creative and that he is the creator. And that he is continuing to do a work of creation and recreation in my life. Abraham Heschel was a, is a Jewish um, 
theologian, and he wrote a book called The Sabbath. And in that book, he talks about the blessedness of the Sabbath, the beauty of the Sabbath, and he says that the Sabbath is like a cathedral, or he says a sanctuary within time. Why did God build a sanctuary for the Israelites in the first place? If you go back in Exodus, he says, let them build me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. God has given us a sanctuary within time. A time where he says for 24 hours, I want to dwell with you. I want to spend extra time with you. That is the beauty of the Sabbath that I see. That is why I am a Seventh-day Adventist, the seventh day. Because it is a reminder, not just that Jesus is my Savior, which is very important, but that I have a Creator God who loves and cares for me and wants to spend time with me. Not just one day of the week, but throughout the week, but especially wants that special time to spend with me every Sabbath. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the gift of the Sabbath. I thank you for creating us to not only survive, but to thrive. I want to thank you for the recreation that you do with us, recreating us with a new purpose and a new drive, freeing us from the stranglehold of sin, and recreating a clean heart within each and every one of us. Be with us each and every day, and may we remember on this Sabbath day, especially what you have done for us. May we worship the Creator God for all, for all that you are and all that you do. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.